Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Fabiana Bacchini. I'm the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. Every Friday since March, I've been hosting Facebook Live, uh, bringing a, a team of experts, specialists, researchers, and parents from all over Canada to share with us relevant information for NICU parents and also for healthcare professionals that deal with our babies, either in hospital or in the community. And I also want to share with you that from uh, October 26th to October 30th, I'll be hosting a Premi Health Talks, which will be Facebook Live sessions Monday to Friday, every day starting at 12 p.m. And the focus is on lungs. We're going to talk about RSV, uh, flu season, what to expect during the flu season, COVID-19, what's happening in ICUs across Canada, and how can we deal with the common inter-illnesses during this time. And uh, also on Wednesdays, Kate Robson, who is a therapist and also a mother of two preemie girls, is hosting a real-time peer support group here on Facebook. And to join her group, you can join the Canadian Premier Parent Support Network, which is our private Facebook group. So that is every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And today, um, we're going to talk about neonatal pain. We're going to talk about how babies, uh, how families and clinicians can work together to improve procedural pain management in the NICU. And I have here with us Mariana Bueno, who is a neonatal nurse, a PhD, and is currently a research fellow at SickKids uh, Hospital in Toronto. She is interested in neonatal pain and in ways of improving neonatal pain practices in the clinical setting. Mariana, welcome and thank you so much for joining us here today. Hello, Fabiana. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's a real privilege to talk to you, Fabiana, and to this amazing audience that you bring together through the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. Um, so yes, as Fabiana said, my name is Mariana and I'm a neonatal nurse and it's been 20 years that I've been studying neonatal pain and I am really excited today to share with you some of the things I've been learning um, throughout my career and I would really like to talk to you about how families and clinicians could work together to improve neonatal pain uh, management in the NICU. So thanks again, Fabiana. It's really nice to join you today. Thank you. Marina, you can share your screen now. Okay. Okay, is that clear? Can you yeah, see? It's perfect, thank you. Okay, thanks again, Fabiana. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief presentation on um, how parents and clinicians can help on neonatal manage pain management. And I hope that by the end of the session, we are able to have a few questions and answers and discussions about um, the topic we've been covering today. So just for us to get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about the epidemiology of pain in the NICU. Um, we all know that babies experience lots of painful procedures, invasive procedures during their NICU stay. And uh, although these procedures are important for their stabilization and survival, um, these babies experience pain and stress due to these procedures. So research shows that um, babies are exposed to around 7.5 to 17 procedures a day in the intensive care. And research also shows that um, pharmacological and non-pharmacological analgesia is inconsistently applied. And these results are from studies conducted all over the world in low, middle, and income countries. So this, unfortunately, is still a reality in the NICU. We also know that pain can lead to short and long-term effects um, for babies and uh, they can result in um, negative outcomes on health and development. 
such as altered brain development and function, as well as poor cognition, motor function, and internalizing behaviors. So this really um, poses the question and the importance of managing pain properly during the neonatal period. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about indicators of neonatal pain because we all know that pain assessment is challenging. Babies do not tell us they are in pain. Um, the most well-known sign of pain for the public in general in terms of babies is crying. Um, but we know that babies cry for a lot of different reasons. So we need to look into other clues, into other indicators to really um, in fear that babies are in pain. So we use behavioral indicators, which means how baby behaves. We use biomarkers, how baby's body reacts in terms of, for example, heart rate, oxygen saturation, respiration, and even um, brain imaging is being used as um, uh, an indicator of neonatal pain. And we also know contextual indicators influence how babies um, display signs of pain. So we know that premature babies are less robust, they're less vigorous, so they cry less, they um, move their limbs less when they're crying for, uh, because of a painful procedure. So all these factors may um, give us clues on um, neonatal pain assessment. We have a few um, measures that are um, composed by diff these different indicators, but we don't have an ideal measure. So this is one of the barriers for us to manage pain properly. Uh, but still we need to look into the babies. We need to look for these indicators in order to um, really assess neonatal pain. And as I said, I am interested in techniques or ways of managing pain in babies, especially the ones that can have parental involvement. So today I'm going to talk to you about three different strategies that can be implemented even in the NICU and that could benefit of parental involvement. So the first one is breastfeeding. And obviously mo mothers must be at the NICU to breastfeed their babies during a painful procedure. We are also going to talk about skin to skin care, which could be um, delivered by mothers or fathers in the NICU. And we are also going to talk about sweet solutions um, that really do not require parents presence at the NICU, but babies certainly would benefit about parents participating while um, they undergo these types of painful procedures. So in terms of breastfeeding, we know there is enough evidence to show that breastfeeding is effective and safe for non-urgent procedures. So for example, immunizations, heel lancing, blood work, um, we could use breastfeeding um, as an analgesic strategy. Mothers can breastfeed clinically stable babies. So obviously if it's a baby who is requiring um, ventilation support or if it's a premature who is not able um, to properly coordinate sucking, um, swallowing and uh, breathing, um, we could not offer breastfeeding for these babies, but for the ones that are clinical, clinically stable, this is a perfectly fine intervention to be used in the NICU. We also know that breastfeeding should be started about five minutes before the procedure. So the baby really needs to get a chance of start sucking and be well latched um, and, and really uh, breastfeed throughout the procedure. If the baby is not well attached to the breast, um, the effects of breastfeeding will not be um, as good as they could. Um, and also mothers and babies should be positioned in bed or sitting on a chair in a comfortable position in a space that is, um, offers safety and privacy for them. 
in terms of barriers, um, I think we um, know that breastfeeding, as I said, cannot be implemented for babies with impaired or delayed sucking reflex. Um, we also have lack of awareness of the benefits of breastfeeding as a pain reduction strategy. Um, so many families do not know about uh, the benefits of breastfeeding, but clinicians also are not well aware that they could be um, using breastfeeding for pain relief as well. So this is really um, a type of knowledge translation, knowledge dissemination, knowledge, knowledge mobilization that needs to be done. Um, we have some myths and misconceptions surrounding pain and breastfeeding. So um, lots of clinicians tell that babies could choke if they are breastfed during a painful procedure. And uh, choking is an adverse event that has been monitored in different researches involving breastfeeding and pain. And the results really show it's a very rare adverse event. And it's all also, um, also very minor. So if the baby chokes, it's resolved very quickly without any intervention needed. So it's, it's really uh, a myth that babies would choke. And the other myth is around babies associating breastfeeding and pain. Mm. So some people really feel like if you perform a heel lancing during breastfeeding, the babies would also associate the breastfeeding to a painful um, intervention being performed. And again, we know this is not true because babies breastfed multiple times a day although uh, painful procedures we could perform once, twice, or three times while the baby is being breastfed. So this is really not um, a result of this type of intervention. And finally, organizational factors, which is mainly about having a space to have mothers um, sitting comfortably in a chair, for example, if they are in the NICU, having a space that offers mothers privacy, and um, also having the ergonomic um, needs for the healthcare professional to perform the procedure while the baby is breastfeeding. So those are the main barriers um, surrounding breastfeeding that we still need to work on and that we still need to um, resolve to implement and to increase the use of breastfeeding in the NICU. Um, in terms of skin to skin care, we also know this is a strategy that's effective and safe for non urgent procedures. Um, mothers and fathers can hold their babies in an upright position against their bare chest while the babies wear only diaper. So we know that um, the skin to skin is crucial for the effectiveness of this intervention. So if the mothers or fathers are wearing a shirt or a gown, if the baby is using wearing clothes or is wrapped, the effects are not the same. So it really um, needs, there, they must be in skin to skin contact. And what could be done um, to keep the baby warm um, during the procedure is that mothers and fathers could use a gun or a blanket to really wrap the baby and cover its uh, back so they would be warm, they would keep their body temperature throughout the procedure. Um, in order to achieve um, the best effects, skin to skin care should be started about 15 minutes before the procedure. So mothers, fathers, and babies should have some time to settle, to accommodate, and then the procedure should be done while the baby is still in skin to skin care. And in terms of the barriers, we um, also need to uh, be mindful of the clinical stability of the baby to uh, mobilize and to position the baby into um, mother's or father's chest. Um, there's also a lack of awareness of the benefits. So we know parents are not um, widely aware um, of the use of skin to skin care as an algesic strategy, as well as clinicians. Um, lots of them are really not aware 
of the benefits as well as of the time that needs for the intervention to be, to be really effective. And again, organizational factors. So mothers and fathers must be present for skin to skin care to be implemented. They need to have a space, they need to have a chair um, so they can be accommodated, so they can um, be safe and in a private environment. And also the procedures should be done while the parents are at the NICU. We know lots of um, blood collection for uh, routine exams are done very early in the morning, first thing in the morning, usually without the parents. So it's really changing the culture, changing the routine so we can really incorporate the parents into these two different types of interventions, breastfeeding and to skin to skin care um, for pain relief in babies. The last intervention I'm going to talk about is sweet solutions. So we could use sucrose and glucose for pain relief during invasive procedures as well. We know that small amounts as little as 0.1 ml could be used and offered directly to the mouth of babies two minutes prior of the procedures. Um, sucrose or glucose could be used if parents cannot be present or, can, or if the babies cannot be breastfed or positioned into skin to skin care. So ideally the first option would be breastfeeding then the second option would be skin to skin care. And if these two are not able to be implemented, we would use one, uh, a sweet solution as a pain relief strategy. So the main barriers involve availability of the solution. So sucrose is manufactured and not all of the hospitals have the solution readily available. Glucose, we could use the IV solution, the glucose 25%, that is readily and easily available at the units. Um, lack of awareness is also one of the barriers. Not all the clinicians are aware or know how to use or know the dose. Um, and organizational factors as well in terms of protocols and uh, guidelines for using sucrose or glucose. Um, we have a few studies that um, indicate there might be some long-term effects of repeated use of sucrose or glucose in the development of the babies as well. Um, but we know those studies involve um, kind of a larger amount of sucrose. So that's why we need to be very mindful, use as little as possible and limit the number of doses that we offer per day. Um, there are some additional non-pharmacological pain management strategies that can be implemented. And usually we could combine different strategies. So for example, non-nutritive sucking, we could offer a pacifier to a baby who is positioned in skin to skin care. So the combination of sucking and skin to skin care really uh, potentialize the analgesic effects of these both um, interventions. So sucking could be offered with um, skin to skin care, with sweet solutions, for example. Facilitated tucking involves positioning like fathers, mothers, or even a clinician can hold the baby in a fetal position. So it's really containing the baby, but we using um, their hands. Um, so this could be implemented with non-nutritive sucking and even with sweet solutions as well. So when we combine these interventions, we have better analgesic effects. And swaddling is really wrapping the babies and making the babies like um, comfortable and really contained. And we could also um, use wrapping, swaddling, combined with non-nutritive sucking and um, sucrose. So we could involve parents in all these strategies that I presented. It's really simple to teach them. They are willing to learn. They are willing to participate. So it's really up to the clinicians to open 
their NICUs and welcome the parents, welcome their participation. Um, so these strategies, they are displayed, especially breastfeeding, skin to skin care and um, sweet solutions. They are displayed in two different videos that were produced by Dr. Denise Harrison. She's a colleague who um, was a faculty at the University of Ottawa by the time she produced these videos. So the first one is targeted at parents and really wants to empower parents on how they can implement and how they can use the three different strategies. The second video, which is called Be Sweet to Moms and Babies Performing Baby Blood Tests While Breastfeeding or Holding Skin to Skin is targeted at clinicians. So they, um, they, they have a little bit of a tip, tips in order to perform these procedures in an ergonomically way um, while the babies are positioned to breastfeed or skin to skin. So it's really adapting their techniques, their postures to be able to perform the procedures with the baby positioned in a different way. So those videos are available on YouTube. I believe the links will be available in the comments of the session and you can watch and share um, and help us spread the knowledge. So I think some take home messages are that there is high incidence of procedural pain in neonates being pain management strategies inconsistently applied. And again, all over the world, not only in poor and middle income countries, but also in high income countries. We have simple, effective and safe strategies for neonatal pain management that should be implemented more frequently into our daily practice. And lastly, parents should be involved as much as possible on neonatal pain care. They can contribute, they are willing to do so. So it's really up to clinicians to open up some space, educate them and encourage them to participate. So I leave here my email, my Twitter handle, and I think we open the floor for questions now. Wow, Mariana, thank you so much for your presentation. And, I, and you're talking about the pain procedures in the ICU. And it really brings me back to my days in the ICU when my baby was born at 26 weeks. And I saw him on ventilator for seven weeks, with suctioning yeah. all the time. And I always wondered whether he was in pain or not because he couldn't cry. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard for me as a mom when I came to the ICU every morning and I saw... They had this little chart by the bedside with the skin breaks, how many skin yeah. breaks they had in a day. And I remember one day was 13 and I cried because they poked my son 13 times and I wasn't even there. Yeah. So my question to you is, it's not only, okay, the, the strategies are very simple mm -hmm. as we can see, I think is, you know, things that we advocate for breast, more breastfeeding, skin to skin, all of that. But the ICU has to be open to it. There yeah. is a, it has to be a cultural shift that the parents can be part of the procedure yeah. uh, with the baby. And because there's a lot of conversations that parents don't want to see the procedure. Mm -hmm. But I was never asked if I yeah. want to see or not see. But I think there is need to be this cultural shift. What can you talk about this? How have you, what have you seen along these years? Yeah. Well, um, I can say that research shows now that parents want to be involved, that parents are willing to be involved. There's uh, an amazing researcher called Linda Frank, mm -hmm. and she's been doing lots of um, interviews, focus groups with parents, and all these statements that parents do not want to see, parents do not want to be present, parents do not want to participate, those are really not parents' statements. So they are willing to be there, they are willing to help their babies, especially if they know that their presence is beneficial for the babies. Of course, if the clinician tells you, you should better leave, your baby will be crying that much and you're nervous, you will influence all on his stress level. So you should better wait a little bit outside. 
Um, of course, you will believe the clinician, right? If you're not informed, if you're stressed, you're a first time mother or like you're at the NICU with your baby, whatever a clinician tells you, you trust them, right? Um, so I think it's really lack of um, knowledge or awareness from the clinicians and from the parents as well. I think all this knowledge is really um, new. It's around 40 years that we understand better pain in babies and how to better manage pain in babies. So I think it's, it's still evolving, but I, ag I agree it's about time we open up the doors of the NICUs. We know around the world that there are NICUs that allow parents to stay for one hour a day, two hours a day, and this is really not uh, the way we should be treating babies and their families. Like that parents should be allowed to stay as much as they can and to participate as, as much as they can, provided they have enough information to decide what is the degree they want to be involved. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, and Linda Frank has an amazing research in, yeah. uh, San, in, in San Francisco. She yes. talks about family integrated care, how to bring families into the care of their babies, which is a, an international project that yeah. uh, we start here at Mount Sinai Hospital. Yeah. So there is so much there on parent involvement and how to really be part of the team, especially yeah. now during the pandemic when we know yes. that a lot of NICUs has limited the number of parents and hours that parents can spend with their baby. Yeah. So we, we yeah. shall see the long-term impact of that because we still don't know because it's so new. But yeah. Mariana, one question that is coming from our live, uh, it, which is more effective, morphine or fentanyl and which is more safe long-term? Um, well, of course there are um, pharmacological strategies that I did not talk about during this presentation because I really wanted to focus in interventions that parents could be participating. Um, we have lots of studies in terms of morphine and fentanyl. Um, both are effective, both have different um, side effects and they're indicated for different um, situations. Um, but I guess we really need to be mindful and use these medications in the NICU environment with all the equipment um, ready and properly um, tested. So it really depends for what you are using morphine or fentanyl. We know, for example, morphine and fentanyl are not effective for hulances. So even if the baby is receiving a continuous infusion of morphine, this is not effective for uh, a heel lens. You should still use breastfeeding or skin to skin care or um, sucrose. So it, it, it's really, um, that are really different ways of using these interventions and that are different um, reasons for what you're using them. Okay, thank you. Marina, I want to talk to you a little bit about the procedures that babies have in the NICU mm -hmm. when they are a little bit older, because when they are very small, 24 weeks or 25 weeks, we might not be able to breastfeed yeah. or hold skin to skin right away during a procedure. So first of all, what are the strategies for that period in the mm -hmm. NICU? But I also want to ask you, uh, for an ROP exam, for, for example, mm -hmm. how can we adapt to those strategies when you, they have to be being lying down on the bed mm -hmm. and we can really uh, move mm -hmm. the baby around? Yeah, well, for extremely preterm babies, there are still lots of uncertainties and things that are being studied and discovered. Um, so obviously those babies are not able to be breastfed or sometimes positioned in skin to skin care. So we would use, for example, sucrose, facilitated tucking, provided they are clinically stable to be handled in, in the proper position. Um, in terms of um, the procedures you asked, like ROP, we know it's, um, it's a stressful procedure. People argue that it's not painful, but people uh, like you as a mother and me as a clinician, I've seen babies going through the procedure and the speculum opening the eyelids and it's really uncomfortable, uncomfortable and really, um, really, I, I would say it's painful. Um, so I would suggest positioning the babies on um, with the parents holding the baby, 
wrapping the baby, giving sucrose, plus they use an anesthetic uh, mixture for uh, directly into the eye, which I think it's helpful too. Um, but this is another example of a procedure who is performed always without the parents. We always ask the parents to leave. And again, this should be, um, we should encourage them to stay and to hold and comfort the baby, talk to the baby and help the baby. This is, this is what they should be doing, even during procedures invasive like the ROP examination. Absolutely. I was actually able to stay on all my son's ROP tests yeah. and they, they really did the, the tucking him in yeah. and had his little pacifier. And right after I was able to hold him and I think, okay, I, I couldn't hold him during the procedure because of yeah. the position, but I could, him, I could hold him right after. But we have another question here. How do we keep, uh, how do we help practitioners in the NICU become more comfortable with breastfeeding and mm -hmm. skipping as interventions? Well, I think this is really a matter of us as researchers finding ways of disseminate knowledge. So the video that I showed um, to you, for example, we've been doing lots of research, um, showing the video to clinicians, using the video in clinical settings to really try to um, foster knowledge uptake. Um, so it's really, uh, I think it's an institutional um, intervention, like it should be guided in terms of a protocol or an SOP that clinicians would receive training, they would be exposed to evidence, they, was, they would be exposed to like high quality information and they would be supported by the intervention, right? Because me as a mother, I've heard sometimes, well, if you're, a if, you, if you're a baby choke while I am providing immunization, I have no um, way of helping him and I have no um, way that my supervisors would um, back us up in, in, in helping you and using breastfeeding. So this is, I think it's, it's not, not only an individual um, change of behavior, but it's also an institutional issue that needs to be addressed absolutely it's, it's, it is a culture shift yeah right because we can yes you can in, teach the individuals but if the yeah. organization doesn't support that practice it's yeah difficult. yeah so we have a lot of work to do mariana for sure yes we do as i said i've been working for 20 years but as a mother i couldn't use these interventions can you believe that i was really frustrated so that's why i continue working Thank you for that. But I also want to ask one last question before we go. Uh, so those techniques, I feel that they also are very good for uh, families when they are in the community, taking baby home from the ICU or even for term babies when they go for yeah. immunizations or, or many of our babies still go for ROP exams after yeah. they leave the ICU. They have to have that follow up. So are they... It, we can support those practices even after discharge and they apply for after discharge? Yes, absolutely. There are lots of studies that support the use of especially breastfeeding and sweet solutions for immunizations up to one year of age, for sure. Um, skin to skin care is more suitable for preterm babies. Um, so as babies grow, they really do not want to be that much tucked and still in, in mom's or dad's chest. But breastfeeding and sweet solutions could be easily used in community practice, as you said. Absolutely. And there, is, there are a lot of videos available besides your videos for, here from Canada. It doesn't yeah. have to hurt. They have a channel on YouTube with a lot of techniques of distractions yeah. and they, the children are actually older. And there's a lot of information for clinicians as well on the SKIP, the Solutions for Kids in Pain. Yeah. I think the website is kidsinpain.ca that has amazing information for clinicians. And I think together we can change how we do things to make outcomes better for babies and families. Because obviously, as a mom, I also don't want to see my child in pain and suffering. And yeah. we have to really work together on that. So, Mariana, thank you so much for joining us here today. I think we could talk for many, many yes. more hours about this topic, but um, I hope you come back another time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fabiana. It was really a pleasure.
Thanks again. Thank you. And so for everyone uh, watching at home, thank you so much for joining us here today. I will be back next Friday with another topic. And you can also register for our Creamy Health Talks that will be happening here on Facebook from uh, October 26th to October uh, 30th. And we're going to be focusing on lungs of the premature babies, addressing COVID-19, RSV, and all the common inter illnesses that are coming here in Canada because we live in the in the in a place where winter is all, always coming but very unlikely like our country Brazil because me and Marianne are from Brazil and you always wonder will we have a winter or not have a winter but here is a certain thing so thank you all for joining us here today and I see you all next time